Hey guys, you ever thought, gosh, dentistry's a little hard. You know, I'm a little frustrated. I could either complain about it or I could whine about it, or I could probably think of some things I could whine about. But what if you actually had a chance to talk with somebody who was a wine expert or somebody who was extra, uh, an expert on whining about dentistry, whatever. Um, so today we're going to be talking to a very fun guest friend of ours that we got to know just in the last year, uh, Katrina Sanders, who is an amazing educator on all things dentistry. And today we're going to wine with the wine genist. And I'll explain what that means here in a little bit. So do me a favor, stick around. Grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to love this. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barron and I am your host where we take a look at the best business practices from the best business practices all over the country. And boy, do I have a treat for you. She is a rock star, an incredible educator, and just fun to talk to Katrina Sanders. And uh, we're going to find out why they call her the dental wine genist. And it's a fascinating story. I've heard it. Uh, but we're going to get the story and all the details today. But uh, a couple of things. I always like to do this. If you're here at the podcast for the first time, um, number one, we love education. I love just sharing thoughts. And you're going to see I'm not that smart. That's why I bring on smart people like Katrina. And we just ask her questions and we'll get the answers from the real experts. But if you're finding yourself here to the podcast for the first time, it's crazy because I, I you know, I talk with everybody about this. We do all this video and I think people are just videoed out, but the audios go extremely far over 140,000 audio downloads. Uh, and I'm just crazy grateful. I don't know how it works. All I know is it's working and we love the questions and the emails we get. So do me a favor. If you're dri well, if you're driving, don't keep driving, but you know, if you're listening to the podcast, whether you're working out, working in the garage, driving, whatever, do me a favor, just uh, scroll down to that little button. You see where it says subscribe, hit the subscribe button on your podcast, whether it be Stitcher, iTunes, Google podcast, doesn't matter. And here's why you're going to see every single week, I'm going to show up and bring you a brand new expert in dentistry so that we can learn best practices. So you can create a better practice and a better life. And I don't want you to miss out. So make sure you join. And then you're also going to see it's just a great community of people. We don't have any egos here. Dentistry is the greatest profession ever, and it's just a very helpful profession. So uh, make sure you keep showing up. And if you haven't joined our private Facebook group, make sure you join us over there. It's called The Best Practices Powered by ACT Dental. And again, we don't really know how that's working either. Uh, all we know is that a lot of people are back there chatting. So over 14,000 of you um, so just go over there and check it out and you're going to see it's a pretty helpful community of people. And then lastly, there probably isn't a day that goes by people don't say, what do you do? And I'm like, I don't even know. But, um, but the truth of it is, is we're dental practice coaches. So we work with dental practices, you know, all over the country teaching, you know, dentists and teams how to create a better practice and a better life. So if you're a dental practice owner, you're thinking, gosh, I think think my practice could be a little bit better. Like maybe the schedule could be a little bit better. Maybe, you know, I'm not making enough money. There's not enough profit to even do something fun with my team, or maybe my team's not getting along and I, I care about them and I just want a better culture, or I'm just tired of writing off 35% in all of these PPOs or more, which means you're working one out of every three, three days for free. So don't let that upset you. It's just the truth. So join us over at actdental.com where we got a team of coaches. We're just here to help you in any way. I want you to enjoy going to work. Like the biggest battle in dentistry is not dentistry itself. It's just going to work and how you do it. And so you can create a great practice. Here's the cool thing. If you remember nothing today, there's no rules in dentistry. You can create whatever you want. You don't have to work anyone's hours. You don't have to do it anyone's way. You can do it your way. Think about that. It's pretty fun. So um, speaking of doing it their own way, I mean, there's been a superstar that's come out of the scene. I want to introduce my guests. So Katrina, I didn't really know who you were. 
Now, I, I got to tell a story. So, Adriana Booth is like an amazing coach over mm -hmm. here. She's she's also very good at a lot of things. Like she's just like a very talented person. So I'll often go to her and go, and she'll go, I don't even know what you're saying, but I think I know what you're talking about. And she's like, all right, let me go to work on it. And so she started putting together all these educators. So in a world, I'll be completely transparent. On March 17th of last year, I had a full out panic attack because we, we were having fun. And then our everybody's business hit a halt. And so we came up with this idea to do a conference. And one of the uh, 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 to AB was, okay, a conference. She's like, okay, give me a couple days. I'll put together. And then she brought up your name. I'm like, I have no idea. I've never even heard of her. And AB's <laughs> like, no, you don't need to. She's awesome. Now I will tell you, cause we've never, you, I've never told this story, but so it's Bill Robbins, myself. And then, uh, it was Barrett and the rest of her. And we're like, oh my God gosh, who is this woman? And it was wildly entertaining. It was wildly informative. Half the stuff I, I didn't even know what you were talking about, but I'm like, she really knows what she's <laughs> talking about. So I know who you are. If people watch the COVID conference, they know who Katrina Sanders are. But if somebody's tuning in for the first time today, I want people to know who Katrina Sanders is. Who is Katrina Sanders? Oh, hello. Uh, Kirk, thank you so much for having me, by the way. And as a fellow Midwesterner, obviously I'm honored, humbled, and grateful to be here. And I'm loving the Midwest accent, by the way. Uh, my, name is, <laughs> my name is Katrina Sanders. I am a practicing dental hygienist. Uh, and my brand is uh, the Dental Wine Genist. So a little bit about who I am. Uh, a brief 30-second over the balcony look. Uh, I am a practicing dental hygienist. I've been practicing for 14 years here in in a periodontal practice in gorgeous Phoenix, Arizona, um, where I perform uh, surgeries alongside our diplomats to the American Board of Periodontology. Uh, I also own several businesses where I'm an educator, consultant, podcaster, uh, writer, advisory board member uh, for several different periodicals. I have a relatively provocative look at dentistry. Um, my brain, I think, works a little bit differently. And so I've certainly built a, a tribe, a following of people who are in alignment with some of the contrarian or provocative ideas that I have in dentistry. My, uh, uh, my tagline is that I'm not everybody's cup of tea but I'm someone's glass of wine. And I'm honored and grateful to be here uh, working alongside you, Kirk. And of course, Adriana is incredible. Um, it's truly a pleasure to know that the work that I'm doing is resonating with the community um, because I'm very much in alignment with you in the fact that dentistry is stressful enough as it is for us as clinicians, for our patients, for the front office team, for the people that we work with, for our loved ones who have to deal with us when we come home after a long yeah. day in the practice. And so I'm in alignment with you that dentistry um, doesn't need to be as difficult as it is. And there are ways that we can work together to make it better for everyone. So I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so pumped to have you here. Now, if you, I'm just going to say this. If you're not following her on social media, you need to. Now, I do want to ask you about that. So, like, when you mm -hmm. got going, what you do is very unique. It's not mm -hmm. like anything mm -hmm. else. And it's, it's almost like, okay, what is she up to today? Like, what? Are, <laughs> oh, my gosh. How cool is that? So, how did you, I, I do want to ask, how did you get started? Like, the dent, the wine, like, give me the, the origin of the story, because today we're going to be talking about whining in mm -hmm. dentistry. Let's mm -hmm. talk about your story, the why of this and how that all came together. I, I want to know that. Yeah. So it's actually kind of a crazy story. I was, I, I'm a multi-passionate polymath. Like I, when I find something, I want to learn about it. I want to grow in it. <clears throat> and uh, I've always had an unwavering passion for dentistry and particularly dental hygiene. I was working as a faculty member. I had made it up the, the ranks in the ladder. Um, next step was going to be program director. I was on my way to the top. I had just gotten my master's degree in education. And I realized that I was burning out and that the work that I was doing, although I loved it, it didn't love me back. I had developed a a stress-induced heart murmur. Um, I was working hours around the clock uh, just at an unbelievable pace and um, the work didn't feel good. So I left uh, teaching in my faculty position. I started temping again as a dental hygienist and I, I wrote about what it is that I wanted to be when I grow up. 
And I uh, bought this guided journal that asked, the very first question was, if you could do whatever you wanted for the rest of your life and money was no object, what would you do? And the reality is, I think we would all say, oh, I want to lay out by the beach all day and do nothing. But we all are passionate human beings. And at the end of the day, after two weeks of laying on a beach doing nothing, most of us would get sick of that, that we have a, an ultimate purpose in something that we want to do. So I wrote, I want to drink wine, talk about dental hygiene, and save homeless animals. That's what I wrote. <laughs> and this was four years uh -huh. ago. So fast forward a few months later, um, I had some previous students of mine who had since graduated and asked me if I would write some programmatic content for them in helping them with alternative injection techniques. I happened to be studying for my level one sommelier exam and I had created a lot of really great partnerships in the community. So I was a VIP member at the time with a local wine bar in town. They let me rent out the backspace of their room to be able to deliver this content. And I put together this little rinky dinky flyer. It was so dorky. Like looking back now, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed. But I put together this rinky dinky flyer, put up a sign up page on Facebook or whatever, and posted that and then went to go temp for the day. And when I came home, I had sold out my tickets. And in fact, I had oversold the course to the point where I had actually rent additional chairs from a rental place. And the fire marshal was not very happy with the number of people in the space. But at any rate, I, I had sold these tickets. People came to see this coursework delivered by me at this little local wine bar in Old Town Scottsdale. We served charcuterie boards, which are basically like adult Lunchables, by the way, um, <laughs> and glasses of wine. And we had a delightful time. And quite honestly, I recognized in that moment that because everybody was sipping wine and we were in this co comfortable space of just being at this wine bar together, almost just like colleagues sharing ideas over a glass of wine, that I could say provocative things. I could say some of the things that maybe we all know to be true in our profession, but maybe we're not saying it out loud. And, and maybe if I name it, if I can say it out loud, then maybe we can work together to change that. Maybe we can uh, collaborate, share ideas, or maybe put an end to the things that are not us in our profession. So that uh, was really the birth of the dental wine genist, Kirk. And from there, it's just blossomed into what it is today. It's genius because Katrina adds to this. I mean, dentistry can be a very isolating profession or even yeah. hygiene or even assisting. Yes. Like yes. I feel, feel extra, like I have a special place in my heart for, you know, assistance, hygienists, because they they tell people, but a lot of people don't understand. Would you agree? Right. I, I completely agree. And I think the biggest challenge for us is that in dentistry, in dental school, in dental hygiene school, it's like a little mini sorority or a little mini fraternity. And so the challenge is like we were really brought into this profession as a cohort moving through dentistry or dental hygiene together. And then graduation day happens. And then we get kind of thrown into the deep end without floaties on. We're doing our first crown prep or we're doing our first SRP and we don't have a faculty to check on us. And we're like, okay, this is weird because that's what we were used to. And it is isolating. We're, we're stuck in this operatory where now a lot of times we don't have other colleagues to share ideas. Hey, come look at this x-ray. What do you see? If you're a one doctor practice, you don't have somebody aside from maybe your hygienist to share some of those ideas. And if you're a one hygienist in the practice, you don't have somebody to help you sharpen instruments or, hey, if you're struggling to remove that piece of calculus, you don't have a, a colleague to bring into the operatory to help you out. And so this is, I think, where a lot of ideas stop. A lot of high level clinical practice care stops. And I wanted to be a part of the conversation that isn't happening in dentistry. And so you want to have a fabulous conversation, Kirk, you got to bring some great wine. So yeah. <laughs> that's where we are, the birth of the dental wine, Genist. And ironically, here I am four years later, I have built a business where I drink wine, I talk about dental hygiene, and I have four rescue animals that I have saved. Yes, I am a little bit of an addict. I, I need to go through a step, a multi-step program, but I'm a recovering dog rescue addict. And I'm very grateful to be able to do that. That is such a cool story. And I didn't know that. Okay. You got to go back to a couple of things. A yeah. level, you were studying to be a level one sommelier. How many, first of all, I didn't know that. Secondly, okay. how many levels and how far did you go? And then you mentioned other business. I, like we just, we built a training center here and it was all ready to go like by April of last year. Well, pandemic. Perfect. That's so perfect I already, timing. I already, I already know we're going to have you back here and you're going to do it. 
a charcuterie. What is it called? A charcuterie. charcuterie. Yeah. Adult Lunchables, we'll call it. Yes. There you go. <laughs> and, and a wine and an education thing as soon as we're up and running again, which probably will oh, be for a while. perfect. But go back. So level one, you were studying me a level one sommelier? Sommelier. Now, many- yes. Yes. Okay, so so in the. That? So it's, it's a, it's a wine and beer and spirits expert, according to the court of master sommelier. So I tell people, I'm not just like some crazy ginger that likes to drink wine by herself in her kitchen. I do have a certification. Um, there are four levels to becoming a sommelier, the top level being a master master sommelier, of which there are, I think, only two or 300 master sommeliers in the world. Um, So it takes quite a bit, many, many, many years and mentorship to get to that point. Um, But I do have my level one, um, which is, uh, you know, in the sommelier world, it's like, okay, you get this like teeny tiny little pin. But by the way, that's bragging rights, Kirk. So if you and I were to go out and want to order a bottle of wine somewhere, people would see my pin and think I'm kind of a big deal. Um, So I've studied for that. And I'm working on my W set, um, which is a completely different group. Um, of people studying for their sommelier exam as well. If you have an interest in wine, um, you know, there are some really great uh, introductory training courses, things that you can take. But of course, my goal in wine tasting is I want to remove that highbrow um, layer that I think uh, creates some fear for people in going wine tasting. So when I do my wine tasting notes, I firmly believe that this is an entirely unique experience. Like um, you're from the Midwest, so you know, like there was a smell to grandma's basement, like yes. just that, like mossy, you know, and it's like, Oh, and I, I had a cab, uh, from Mendoza a couple weeks back and I swirled it and it was like, this smells like grandma's basement is the only way I could describe it. But that was like a smell deja vu from like back in my childhood. It's a very personal experience. And so <laughs> I, I want to c- remove those layers. I just want to make it fun. We sip some really unique, special wines, um, things that, uh, you know, I, I'll do pairings with chocolates around Valentine's day. Um, you know, just to keep it fun, keep it light and keep it interesting. And it truly is a fascinating world um, of what winemaking is, uh, how to cultivate the wine and how to produce it. It truly is incredible. That is so awesome. So my wife and I were huge wine fans. I mean, we don't know the first thing about it, but we love, <laughs> you know, we love pretending in this, but smell of yep. grandma's basement was not like, I love that. I love how you mm-hmm. put all those together. So uh, you and I are going to, we're going to do a bunch of these and we're cover different topics. We're going to do it. Yep. Yep. I well, like it. <laughs> I want you to go to the topic of like whining. So I, I, I yes. mean, you saw this now, this is a very noble profession, but we saw some weird stuff in the last year. We saw, you know, uh, tribes of people turn on. I was like, Oh my, we saw the best and we saw the yeah. worst. Tell me yes. what you experienced in the last year when you talk about whining in dentistry. What, what were some of the observations you had? Yeah. So, and thank you for bringing that up. First and foremost, I do want to remind uh, my colleagues watching this dental school, dental hygiene school on your graduation day, you say an oath. Um, and that is a promise to the profession that for better or for worse, you are going to serve the community. And that means for better when production is up and doctors buying everybody's Starbucks and we're going on fabulous group trips together to CE retreats. And it means for worse during a global health crisis when we have to, you know, really deep dive into what our profession is. And to your point, Kirk, there were a lot of um, dividing uh, pieces that were being thrown around social media. And to be clear, uh, social media was really the place that a lot of us remained connected during the shutdown that occurred. But I think dentistry was caught with its scrub pants around its ankles when the pandemic happened. And the reason for that, I think, first and foremost, is that a lot of things that we needed to address in dentistry but hadn't had been swept underneath the front office rug. There are things that we should have been talking about, like uh, lack of leadership, inefficiencies within the practice, hygienists stepping into their power as the secondary clinician with a license in the practice. Who's responsible for this patient care? Is it the doctor's patients? Is it patients of the practice? And when we started to talk about the lack of continuity in communication strategies, um, how, how leadership teams were reaching out to their teams to support them, it became abundantly clear that there were a lot of things that we needed to work on that we hadn't. In addition, of course, to the challenges of supply chains. And many of us, I I will say I'm very fortunate, the practice that I work with, we had all of this in place 
prior to this pandemic, but many of us in dentistry did not have the right PPE, the right high volume evacuation, the right patient screening entities. We didn't have reception areas that were big enough to accommodate patient flow in an abridged way. And so dentistry really took a step back as a dental hygienist. I think one of the greatest disparities that we experienced in the dental hygiene profession is the back and forth that occurred between am I considered an essential versus a non-essential worker. And I think that created a huge chasm, not only in us versus them, of <clears throat> hygienists um, being seen as drama queens in the practice, but also hygienist versus hygienist, that there were many hygienists that were concerned when this pandemic came out that acknowledged early on that we were the tippy top of professions that were at elevated risk for experiencing this infection because we take our patients' masks off, we generate aerosols, we're within six feet of a patient for over 30 minutes. So yes, we have an exposed rate uh, or higher rate of exposure rather. So yes, we should be concerned. But does that mean that what I do is not essential? Right. I disagree. I think that what I do is highly essential. I'm not uh, risking my life to just to clean someone's teeth. I'm an inflammatory specialist who's highly trained in infection control. And before I go back to the operatory, I want to make sure that we're doing this safely so that I'm not putting myself at exposed risk, uh, nor am I putting the rest of the team members or other patients at risk. And that's where the conversation got away from us, Kirk, is because these conversations that we should have been having about the essential nature of the work that we do, the responsibility that we have to the profession, that that conversation went out the window. And it was more about us having fears about our safety or lack thereof when we go to work. It was about hygienists feeling like they needed to prove something to their doctors. Maybe it was about doctors not listening to hygienists. When hygienists said, listen, I've been doing the research, I've been taking the CE coursework, and we need to have the, this PPE, we need to have this layer strategy in place before we go back to work. And, and maybe before that, the doctor wasn't listening to the hygienist. Maybe the hygienist wasn't involved in any of those steps. So the concern really became so much was swept underneath that rug. And with one wave of a regulatory hand, boom, everything got, got blown out and it was exposed, pun intended. We were exposed as dental professionals to the things that were inadequate in our profession, the conversations that needed to be happening. And that's where I think we've had the opportunity since March 17th to do better as a profession, to take what it is that we've experienced during this global health and financial crisis and really create the pivots that dentistry has so desperately needed for so long. And I'm honored yeah. and grateful to be a part of it with so many people. You said that so well. I don't think I've heard anyone in dentistry articulate. No, I'm not kidding. That I mean, I we obviously enjoy you as a great educator here, but that is so well said. And I mean, our... Listen to what she said. Our simplified version was because that's what we saw too. We basically saw people that cared that showed up. People mm -hmm. that weren't good at caring for others that showed up also. So yes. the dentist would call and go, oh, I can't believe this. And I'm like, well, did you even talk to your team prior to this? You know, our best performing practice, I'll never forget. I called them and he's like, first thing I did. And they're in Florida. He rented a tent and he had everybody meet outside. And he goes, look, I don't even know what this is, but I do know one thing. I'm going to take care of you guys. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like his goal mm -hmm. to communicate every day. I don't even know what any of this means. Like I, I just, mm -hmm. and I thought that was such a powerful statement. And so they were communicating amazing. every day and then they, they found ways to just stay engaged. And like, we all were dealing with unknowns, but I, I, I think you just said it so well that things were exposed. Now, here's my question is, I think a, you just said what a lot of us were feeling. What's happened since that? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any big changes or things that you're like, wow, that's great, or things that aren't so great since that? 
Yeah. So, and thank you for saying that. I, I really do. Th I want to take a moment to acknowledge the leaders that are out there that have done a phenomenal job because I think oftentimes we do like to whine about it. We like to talk about the negatives of what happened in dentistry um, around the same time. And I want to first say that a, a big piece that I experienced personally are the amazing leadership teams that came out of the woodworks to your point, Kirk, to say, I'm here, I'm here to take care of my team because if you take care of your team, then your team will take care of the patients of the practice. And I, I do want to acknowledge my employer, AZ Perio. Um, early on, they were saying things like, um, hey, if you can't afford an Easter dinner for your family, please let us know so that we can get you a gift card to a local grocery store. Things that they were doing to wrap around their, their team members to really make them feel whole. So I'll say that you that was a huge Ralph? positive. I'm I sorry. You worked, you worked for Ralph? I do work for, oh yes, Ralph oh my Wilson's God. my buddy. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yes. I, when you say, I did not know that either. Like Ralph, I've had him on, he's a great guy. Incredibly he's a great sharp guy. guy. And he loves him some uh, Stevens Point because he loves going golfing up at the uh, up at the resort up there in the Century World. But yeah, he's a hoot and a half. He's great to work with. Um, he's funnier than all get out and incredibly smart and very talented doctor. So yes, he he was a part of, the incredible team. And I, I do, while we're on the conversation of Dr. Wilson, um, they also had conference calls where they brought the entire hygiene team on with the doctors. And they were asking, how comfortable do you feel returning to work? What are things that we can get you to make sure that you're comfortable? What strategies, what steps can we do to help support you? We started to see things like within our Seattle study club, I started to build out um, little COVID-19 updates. So every week we would do a little, um, you know, grab your glass of wine, virtual study club, where I would just give you the new information as we had it from the CDC about where we're going, the World Health Organization, about what it is that we need to be doing from a layered approach. So we started to see this focus around keeping people connected, keeping people educated. I loved early on that there were so many of us that wanted to wrap around the dental community and provide education. We were on COCA calls. We were looking at the CDC website constantly to gather this information and disseminate it to the community in a high level way. And so what we started to see was this, in my opinion, gorgeous pivot, a great opportunity where dentistry looked back at evidence-based research. They now more than ever during this pandemic wanted a speaker who was saying, here's what we're going to do. And here's the research behind it. Not just interpreting things to interpret things and building out fake protocols based on how I interpreted it, but rather this is what the research says. So this is how we're going to move forward. And so we started to see some really great high level conversations. We started to see patient screening taking effect. And what that did, that, that peeled back the layer that a lot of hygienists have had grief about for a long time. And that is how do you update health history information on patients who are not interested in updating health history information. Well, now it kind of became this like societal norm that if you walk in somewhere, you know, you want to go and get an eyebrow wax, you have to fill out a form stating where you've been, if you're experiencing any symptoms, et cetera. So dentistry could help kind of supplement a lot of those things. And then of course, as a periodontal hygienist, the incredible amount of information out there linking oral inflammation, oral disease, oral biofilm right back to COVID-19 has been incredibly impactful. My provocative idea on that being remove the word COVID from the conversation and add in stroke, heart disease, upper respiratory tract infection, certain types of cancers, diabetes, any other one of the 57 biological conditions or diseases that have a plausibility back to periodontal disease. And I think we can all agree that we now have a scintillating conversation that we can have with our patients. In my opinion, Kirk, the greatest thing that happened for dentistry was this. Before the pandemic started, I used to travel around. I spoke on stages all across the United States, around the world. And I would say, I wish that something happened. I wish that there was something out there that happened to the community that helped the general public understand that disease in the mouth can be relatively asymptomatic. It, it can show up as, as a non-painful, um, non-overt disease, but it's still there. 
and we need to treat it while it's still there. I wish that our community understood risk factors, that it's not my fault that I didn't do, I, I didn't do a poor profi on you six months ago. Maybe, sir, you have other risk factors. Um, you know, maybe you have a familial history or a genetic component. Maybe you have a, a physiologic, uh, you know, change or reaction to oral inflammation. Maybe you have a different type of biofilm in your mouth. Uh, maybe you have different anatomy. Maybe you as a general public need to need to receive some education about risk factors. And I wish that there was something that happened. I used to joke, like maybe the Girl Scouts of America will do like a PSA or something to educate the community. And be careful what you wish for, because what happened or what resulted is that our, our country and around the world, societies were covering their mouth to protect their body from disease. That society began to understand that the mouth is a portal to the rest of the body. Society watched on the news as certain populations experienced an elevated risk factor. These individuals on this list were at elevated risk for experiencing advanced signs, stages, or symptoms of this disease. And by the way, this virus can occur in people who are otherwise asymptomatic. And so what we need to do first and foremost is lean on prevention, and we need to lean on testing and screening with our healthcare entities to help us better understand how to control this disease. And so now here we are in dentistry, the greatest challenge for us being we see patients in a perceived state of health. We see patients who think it's completely normal to bleed from the mouth. They're not worried about a cavity unless it's hurting them. Their number one concern is, should I get whitening? Should I get adult braces? And so the concern for us is, how do we take dentistry? How do we drive home the concept of risk assessment? How do we drive home the concept around asymptomatic qualities of disease and help close these cases, not only to increase our treatment acceptance with our patients, but to be able to treat the population the way that they've needed to be treated since we've understood the prevalence of disease across the United States. And so in my opinion, the best thing that came out of this pandemic is we now have an educated community, a community that understands disease prevention, that understands infection control, and is now looking to the medical entities to help support them in health, wellness, and vitality. You are awesome. Now, if you're listening you already know why we love having Katrina on because she's going to bend your brain. You're obviously extremely passionate about this. And I'll say this, dentistry needs more of you. We really oh, do. Fighting for the thank right you. reasons and um, instead of talking in terms of exceptions. And I believe this and I know, you know, our, the community, like money spent on your oral health is some of the best money you could ever invest we just need yes. everybody else to understand, including dentists and team members alike in that respect. So this is so cool. Now, Katrina, I always like, you know, we've talked about what happened in the past, what's happened mm -hmm. up until since COVID. You know, you do a lot of speaking. You're out there. Mm -hmm. What do you see happening in the next year, two years, three years um, in dentistry on, 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 you know, just from your perspective? I'd love to know yeah. what you think. That's an awesome question. I think a few things. One, I think continuing dental education is going to be perceived differently. I think we've leaned on a lot of virtual programs and I think virtual programs will take a greater um, uh, role in us acquiring education and, and metabolizing that education. But as we mentioned earlier on in this segment, uh, dentistry is relatively isolating. We're very siloed in our operatories. And so I think now more than ever, people being able to go to meetings and wanting to have a conversation if you just want to sit and listen to me talk at you, you can do that by hopping onto one of my webinars and I will talk at you as long as you want. So if we're in person together, if we're in the same room sipping wine together, let's workshop yeah. this. I want to hear what you think. I want to have this dialogue. I want to hear your pain points. I want to hear what's going on with your patients. And so at least for me as a speaker, I'm working to reimagine my slides and my deck. I, I don't want it to just be, I'm tired of hearing my own voice. I, you know, the, the ego of a speaker is really built within their calendar and I have a very busy calendar. So, so one could say I have a relatively big ego, but I'm so tired of hearing my own voice, Kirk. Like I'm so ready to just hear from the community. Like, how can I serve you? How can I show up for you? So I think we're going to see a lot of that. And I think the other big piece 
I hate to say it, is that a lot of us early on, before this pandemic even happened, I was speaking about high volume evacuation, aerosol mitigation, and I had warned the dental community that we are practicing in the petri dish of dentistry, so to speak, that there are aerosols everywhere and that we do need to be concerned about airborne infection. And yeah. quite honestly, I was you know, trying to promote the use of high volume evac and the right PPE and level three masks and you know, wearing hair caps and nobody wanted to listen to me. And then yeah. March 17th rolls around, everyone's drinking green beer and now sliding into my DMs like, hey, I'm ready to listen to you. So I right. think now people uh, within our profession are going to be looking to continuing education to provide that, I don't mean to say next warning, but what I mean to say is I think they're going to be looking to us to provide the information as we see it from an evidence-based perspective. And finally, the community. I started to see a lot of non-dental professionals following a lot of my content because they wanted to understand you know, appropriate infection control standards or even what to expect from their dental professional when they go into their dental appointments. And yeah. so I think we're gonna see a lot more curiosity on the general public side as well, which right. I'm excited about. Now, I wanna ask you about that because evidence-based approach, I totally agree. And tell me if you were experiences, because we had a lot of, practices we're coaching. They're like, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe what I heard from patients today. You know, patients bringing this, I'm like, where did you hear that? They're like, I watched YouTube or I saw on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So my question in that is like how there's always a place for social media to have fun. Like you've yeah. done a wonderful job, but there's also, I mean, dentists now have this, this moving part of social media where, I mean, I'm sure you've watched social dilemma. We don't even know what's up mm -hmm. and down anymore. Like we mm -hmm. take, I found out Kobe Bryant died an hour before the news told me through Facebook. Do you know what I mean? That's like, right. That's there right. are so many things that we learn through social media. How important is it for dentists and dental professionals in the future to really embrace an evidence-based approach and communicate? Like you guys said, you said in Ralph's practice, you guys were downloading things from the CDC. You mm -hmm. were proactively communicating with patients. Are you seeing that? Are you experiencing mm -hmm. that? And think it's going to be like in the future if you're a young dentist watching this? This is a fabulous question. Thank you so much for asking it because it doesn't get asked enough. And this is not a conversation that we're having enough in our profession. Right. So uh, early on, I gathered some data from the CDC about where the general public is gathering most of their information about COVID-19. And wouldn't you know it, right at the top was the news, followed shortly thereafter by social media, uh, followed by, um, you know, looking at the newspaper, listening to the radio, and then kind of down toward the bottom of all of that was healthcare provider. <laughs> <laughs> like that's us way down at the bottom. So social media and the news and what was happening on the internet, um, going to the grocery store, all of those pieces of information were providing more readily available content for the general public to metabolize versus us. And this is where, to your point, we missed the mark because we as dental professionals have social media pages. As practices, we have social media pages. We have websites. And most of us have some type of an e-newsletter opportunity. And so my question early on during the pandemic was, how are you educating your patients? If I go wow. onto your social media platform, is there any information on your social media about how you want to disseminate this information to your patients? Are you sending out e-newsletters to your patients explaining, these are the things, this is my favorite term to use, we have always and will continue to do for you. So showing them some of your infection control strategies, showing them what to expect when they arrive in your office. Because dentistry is already scary as it is. I know it sounds shocking. People don't enjoy coming to see us. I find myself to be a really fun and delightful person, but apparently people are afraid of me. And now let's add on the unknown of all of these right. other things that now our patients are experiencing. So what are you doing? What's on your website? to help your patients understand the steps, the protocols, the mitigation strategies that you're instituting in your practice to protect against COVID. And so we began to see that early on. I filmed a big video series with uh, Dr. Holly McKnight, one of our doctors at AZ Perio, that was pumped out into our general community, basically us saying, is it safe to go to the dentist? And it was a little video, a little you know, 30 second blip, just explaining to our community, hey, this it is safe to go. These are the steps, these are the strategies 
strategies that we're instituting to help protect you. Um, and so it, I implore you to consider that we continue to have high level opportunities to connect with our patients. Go onto your website, look at your own social media. Are you a part of that? Are you a part of fueling our society, our community with this education? Um, and the final piece that I do want to share, this was a new statistic that came out. I read this in a research article a few weeks back that now with people working from home more, people are reading their snail mail more. So a paper newsletter or a paper postcard with information to the general public, more people are reading that now more than ever because yeah. so many entities are going to a virtual platform with so much. So maybe considering your patient population, are they a patient population that actually might uh, you, you may get their attention a little bit more readily if you're sending a, a paper newsletter to them. Um, so there are absolutely some ways, and I think it's extremely valuable for us in the dental profession to acknowledge our role, opportunity, and responsibility in being patient advocates and educators. Yeah, that's so, I mean, all these things you're saying, I'm like having these mini epiphanies. Like I actually opened all my mail last week mm -hmm. because I was Oh, yeah. and I've, yep. I use Barb usually does, and like half of it's junk anyway, but you're so right. You're so mm -hmm. right. So I know we're going to have you back again and again and again. Any, any last thoughts when it comes to whining and dentistry? Like what are <laughs> some of your, your thoughts? And before I ask you some of the fun questions here, I'm excited for the fun questions, but I'll tell you before we, you know, really I, I, I whine about dentistry in jest. I want to be very clear. I'm extremely passionate about dentistry. Uh, I do have a, um, an incredibly optimistic and positive outlook on where our profession is going. Um, I want to be very clear with our dental uh, colleagues here. Um, what you put out on social media, people can see. Um, and dentistry seems to be one of those professions where we have no problem um, bullying each other and, you know, attacking each other, judging each other on social media platforms for our clinical decision making, or why would you do that? Or why would you say that to the patient? And, and I, I'd really love to um, just implore people listening to be kind to each other, um, yeah. because we can't tear each other down. Now more than ever, we have to come together. And now's the opportunity for us to have a collective conversation that helps elevate our profession and support the community in health, wellness, and vitality. So stay strong out there, be safe, and be well. Amen, sister. Okay, so for the benefit of the people that are listening and aren't watching, I want people to follow you. And mm -hmm. so can you direct them where to go if they want to learn more about you? Now, I will say this. If you haven't had Katrina speak to your study club, you're missing out. Like you got to, she can talk on a range of things that are just amazing. You make it fun. I mean, every time you're on, I'm like, wow. So where can Thank I find you. you if I want to follow you or learn more about you? Yeah. So to learn more about me, you can visit my website, which is www.katrinasanders.com. So pretty straightforward. Um, you can also reach me by email, katrina at katrinasanders.com. You can find me on social media. I'm on Facebook at The Dental Wine Genist. I'm on Instagram at The Dental Wine Genist. And I'm on LinkedIn, Katrina M. Sanders, RDH, BSDH, MED, RF. I know it's an alphabet soup. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, but you can find me on any of those platforms. And I do have quite a bit of programmatic content that's really available on demand. That's complimentary. Um, you can join my newsletter. I'm constantly sending out new fun facts information. I also have a podcast. Um, I am a co-host of Tooth or Dare podcast. Um, so please uh, check us out, Tooth or Dare uh, dot podcast on Instagram. And we're on all of the major uh, podcasting apps as well. So uh, yeah. lots of ways just, to get Katrina Sanders into your world. <laughs> I've seen all your, I did not know you had a podcast though. So we're going to check yes. that out. So, yeah, we'll please check. do. Please do. All right. So you know what time it is, right? Yes. This I'm excited. I'm really excited for this. Look at me. Like I, don't, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just have buttons here that I press. So, all right. So that's the fun part. <laughs> And I, I'm just, I'll do a shout out to Len Tao because he gave me this and I just enjoy this because I, I mean, Katrina, I'm like you, I enjoy the, the community. I love the education, but I also love like the fun part of it. And so yeah. I have three questions for you. I don't even know what they are. So here's the first one. Okay. And then I'll, I'll try to answer them with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good, good, good. Ducks fly together, okay. Amelia. Let's do it. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So here's the first one. Do you make a pro and con list or just go with your gut most of the time? Oh my gosh, that's easy. I just go with my gut. All the time? 
Absolutely. Yes. All the time. All the time. Okay. What yes. about when you start your day? Do you do the whole like, okay, I got to get all this done. Are you like me and you actually put a box next to things of things you've already done and you check make, it just. Yeah, so I do okay. make a list and then I check it. I'm like, yes, <laughs> no, but you I know what? <laughs> I do have to do a shout out. I, I just hired a second assistant. Her name is Sam. She's amazing. So shout out if, if Sam is watching this, but Sam has a whole like Katrina to do list. She manages my list. So she's like, okay, listen, this is what you have to do today. Um, and I try to like, you know, follow that and not give her too much of an aneurysm, uh, for <laughs> being so like blase. But, um, as a dental hygienist, I will say, I think I teeter on the type B side a little bit. Like I, I am meticulous and I do things with excellence, but then there's this whole like, meh, it works or it doesn't. I don't know, whatever. So right. I, I will say, I just, I jump right in. I have, I don't think I've ever written a pros and cons list, I think ever in my life. So yeah, I just do. What, what about you? What do you do? It's going to work out for you, you know? It, there I, you go. I, I never do a pros and cons list ever. There so you go. I, See? it's all by gut. I think Zanya Wanin told me that like successful people are 70% accurate. So I'm like, wow, I just hope this isn't one of the three times I've done like this blows up, you know, type of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I don't even know that my percentage is that high, but like I, I do do this. I do do the list every day. So you'll see this and my team hates, I go, Oh yeah, you want me to do that? So this is today. Okay. There you go. Well, That's good. Stop, stop showing us your list that we're not impressed. So I'm a list guy, but not a pros and cons. Now I got number two for you and All right. um, we, we won't make Ralph if he's listening, feel bad about this. So the question is who was the best boss you ever had and what made them the best? Oh, wow. That's that's actually a really great question. I All will right. say, honestly, my best boss is um, is AZ Perio, the CEO of AZ Perio, quite honestly. Um, okay. And because they at AZ Perio believe so much in the hygienist <clears throat> and they believe that if they give us the tools that we need to be successful, that we will take their practice to the next level. And so, you know, Ralph Wilson is a huge part of that. Uh, Jeff Mazzarella is a huge part of it. Um, and then the hygiene team leads, uh, Andrea Fisher and Melissa Stair. They are, I mean, just incredible. And I will say the other amazing thing about it is I'm on the road all the time. I'm delivering webinars all the time. And they are like, you do you like go dream your dream and come hang out with us when you can. They're right. so supportive and so empowering. Um, it, it's just it, it, like, truly, I get choked up when I think about how much I love working in clinical practice. And I'll tell you, Kirk, I get a lot of people saying, when are you going to leave clinical practice? You know, I will say between you and I and everybody watching this, like financially, I don't, I don't need to work clinically. Right. but I love it. I love the operatory. I love the doctors I work with. They, they keep things fun. They keep it professional. They keep it high level. Our standards of excellence are impeccable, but my days in the practice are the best. Like they are the, these doctors that I work with are the best human beings. The hygienists I work with are absolutely incredible. They're talented. They challenge me. I challenge them. Like we're just, we're such a great group that I will say, Honestly, AZ Perio, they're, they're absolutely incredible. And I'm so grateful yeah. for them. They are. I know firsthand how special they are. And I didn't really know them. And then I went out and met with, I'm like, who's Ralph? And I've just enjoyed <laughs> all the You enjoyed meeting Ralph Wilson? Okay. All right. I'm going to add you to the short list of people. <laughs> he's crazy and brilliant and he's a good yes. dude. Um, yeah, just a is. great thinker. So our conversation, like every time I'm with him, he challenges the heck out yes. of me. I'm like, really? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, and I think what you guys Very have good. done out there is crazy special. So that is so Thank cool. You. Yeah. Thank mine, you. mine would be too. So I'm a three-time employee of the month at Applebee's. I don't know if you ever knew that, but I, I had no money growing up. And so when I was a kid, my dad just taught us to hustle. And so I had a boss yeah. his name Schwann. And I remember like, he was, he's like, you want to be good at this? And I'm like, it's Applebee's who cares? You know, I yeah, was 20, yeah, 22, yeah. but he showed me the ins and outs and he's like, you could be better. And like, I, he pushed me hard. And like, every time I drive by an Applebee's, I say to my kids three times and they're like, you're three so times. Boom shakalaka. I look. <laughs> and the other one, um, he, he wasn't directly my boss, but he was my supervisor, Mark Badiato out in Arizona. And uh, he was just a great mentor. He made me go to church, maybe shower, maybe read books. And I was All a young good things. Guy. Cleanse yourself. Do it. <laughs> no, he took me to this course one time. It was in Washington, D.C. He's like, you're going to go watch this guy, Jim, Ro not Jim Rohn, the sports guy, but Jim Rohn, the speaker. Jim Rohn. Yes. He's incredible. 
It was amazing. It was three days. And then I got to know him. I'm like, this is life changing. And then oh, I went wow. to the Dawson top 10 course with him and he was dragging me to these courses. And I'm like, why are you taking me to these courses? He's like, cause I want you to experience education and be better. You're going to grow up. You're going to be a man someday. I'm like, I'm kind of a man. Now. And he's like, not a real one. So, um, it's always good to have, <laughs> I love that. it's good stuff. Okay. What is something that you love that is vintage? Do you have anything vintage that you're like, Oh, I got to have that. Okay. So not like thoroughly vintage, but I will say this. I, and not a lot of people know this about me, but I collect garden gnomes and I'm like, like a garden gnome, you know, like little gnomes that you put in your garden. Yeah. I collect them. Okay. I have an entire collection in my front yard. I have like an entire, like little, like fairy, fairy land world that they live in. I've got like little castles and things that my gnomes live in. And then I've got gnomies out in the back. So anytime that I go to like a, you know, swap meet or something, I'm always looking for like little vintage garden gnomes to yeah. join the the club, join the family of garden gnomes that I have. So I would say that's like the, the big like vintage thing. Although I'm a millennial, Kirk. So now I'm decorating my house in this like mid-century modern. And like I have a like hot orange couch, which my grandmother had in the fifties, you know, <laughs> so cool. like I'm going back to the vintage, like a little bit with my house for sure. What about you? Are you, are, do you have anything that you do that's super vintage? Yeah. So I'm a big music fan. So, um, oh, okay. the first thing that came to my mind was, so my daughter, who's a senior this year. So last year we're in Memphis for a soccer tournament and oh. I'm like, and we're like we're, I'm like, honey, we got to go to Graceland. She's like, what yeah. is I'm it's Elvis. It's where Elvis. No, we're going. And she's like, so is it like this big mansion? I am not, like, it's more visited than, you know, I think sure. it is more the white house. And I so, so I, yeah. her on this tour and I was so into it. And she's like, look at the carpet. I'm like, it's called the jungle <laughs> room. Like you got to understand like, this is where like, and then we saw the plane and she's like, okay, are we oh. almost there? And I'm like, Honey. Oh. so um, anything like that's music or I'm a big Sinatra fan. Like this Sunday we went to a restaurant that plays Sinatra music. I'm like, Oh, nice. Oh, oh. I just love music. So anything vintage like that is just, uh, it always brings me back and it's, it's so that's fun. Amazing. But, uh, Katrina, oh, this has been amazing. I want to do this, have you back again and again. We'll talk about other things. I'd love to have you talk about anesthetic, uh, yes. in an interview and we'll also talk about the perio. Like we couldn't get, I don't think we could ever get enough perio education. Oh, amen. Um, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in alignment. Not only education, but now we could even do a whole show on verbal skills because while yes. we might know some of this, communicating it is a whole nother mm-hmm. ballgame. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm 100% alignment. Yep. All right, yep. cool. So we'll do that. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for watching the Best Practices Show. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor. Hit the share button, share it with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see for Katrina because we'll have her back and we'll ask her the tough questions and get the uh, answers from the experts. So until we see you guys next time, keep watching the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. 